Okay. How we're going to start this morning is we're going to uh, review a little bit. Um, what we've been talking about is something God has been speaking to me for actually a couple of years now, and I'm just finally uh, putting it into a sermon. I'm sorry. Be patient with me. Hey, don't do that. There we go. Okay, what we've been talking about is what I'm calling the eyes habit. There's, there's three eyes. There's first your identity, and then there's your inheritance, and then there is your influence. So the first thing that we've talked about a couple of weeks has been our identity. And really, until you get that one, you're kind of stuck. And we live in a world, uh, you, you hear the word identity politics hear identity all the time. Uh, back in my day, a long time ago, was people would go out to Colorado to find themselves. That's what they call it. Finding out who you are. And people can search around. They, You'll identify, when I was uh, nine years old, you would have thought I played for the St. Louis Cardinals. I, I had my Cardinal hat on all the time. I had a jersey-like shirt, and I had it was my favorite thing in the world. I had the red shoes that they wore. And I just felt like I was a St. Louis Cardinal. And so as I got older, you would have thought I was a member of Ozzy Osbourne's band because that's who I worshipped at the time. And so I had the long hair and I wore my shirt with the 666 on it with an upside down cross. And that's how I identified myself. And as, so everybody's searching for different things. And uh, as I grew up and came to know the Lord, I, I found out that I am a child of God. And I found out in Ephesians chapter 1 that he told me what I was. And that's what this is right here. I am blessed chosen, accepted, adopted, forgiven, and redeemed. And that's who we are. That's in God's sight. That's, that's who he sees us. He's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing, is what Ephesians says. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Um, he's chosen us. And I always go back. I don't know why this affected me so much. I watched it a TV show where it had all these kids in a Russian orphanage. And these kids were never touched. They were just thrown in their crib. Yeah, they changed the diaper and stuck a bottle in their mouth, but they were never cared for. And so they were doing the news story on it and talking about how these people would come in from the United States and they would go through and they would just go through each thing and then they'd pick out a kid. And then that kid became their child, and they were chosen by that family, and they brought them home, and to me that just meant so much that, that God says, he picked me out, he chose me, and then it says that I'm accepted, and there's lots of times in this life where we're not accepted, or we're not picked first in things, and we're left behind. This says that he's accepted us. He's accepted us. And then he didn't just accept us. He adopted us. Same way it was cho we were chosen. He brought us into the family. We, we become a member of his family. And one of the things that I've said each week, and new people kind of go, oh, really? I, did? I never caught that before. 
the world tells you, oh, if, if in certain circles, we're all God's children. We're all God's children. And I've heard people recently say, oh, well, we're all God's children. Jesus would contradict you. He tells people, you're the son of your father, Satan. So we're not all children of God. We're all made by God. We're all actually loved by God. But we're not all children of God. In this, he says, this is how you become one of his children. He adopts you into the family. And then you're forgiven. When you're in that relationship with Jesus, when you have become a Christian, when you've become a child of God, when you've been born again, when you've been made new, or however you want to say it, you are forgiven for every sin that you ever did in your entire life and whatever sin you're going to commit for the rest of your life. It's not one of those things, okay, God forgives me to this point. Now, if I go anywhere, do anything else, if I go and I do something, well, then I'm going to ask to ask for forgiveness. And if I don't ask for forgiveness really quick, I might get hit by a bus and die. So this person asked me one time, so what happens when, when you've been forgiven, but then you walk out in the street and you see the bus and you say, oh my, and then you get hit. You didn't have time to ask for forgiveness, so now you go to hell. Really? Is, is that how God, is, is that how I do one of my children? No. no. He says he's our father, so he treats us in that same way. And so we're forgiven, and then we're redeemed. We're made new. We're, we're, the things that had gone wrong have been healed in us. So this is all review. Um, last week we talked about, uh, a, a little about uh, our inheritance. This is all our identity. That's who we are. Blessed, chosen, accepted, adopted, forgiven, redeemed. Blessed, chosen, accepted, adopted, forgiven, and redeemed. Next time somebody says, you're just a stupid idiot. Why can't you do this job I'm showing you and telling you to coach three times on all, all day? What are you, are you, stupid? Before you slap them, <laughs> you say, I'm blessed. I'm chosen. Use your patience. Accepted, adopted, forgiven, and redeemed. I'm not who this person is saying I am, and they have no right to say who I am. But Jesus does. Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He accepted me even though I had sin. He has a right to tell me who I am. He has a right to tell me that's who you are. Somebody posted on Facebook the other day that they were blessed, and I said, "No, you are blessed, chosen, accepted." <laughs> so uh, that's our identity, our inheritance. I told a little about, uh, and to me, it's a great illustration of the kingdom of God. Um, we we pray when we say the Lord's prayer, "Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven." So we're asking that perfection that's in heaven to come down here. That's, that's what we're, we're asking. Okay, can we get a little of this inheritance that we're going to get? Can we get that to come down here? And so a few years ago, just to tell a little part of my story, at 17 I was thrown out of the house because I was a little crazy. And my mom looked at me when I came home at 4 in the morning and she said, one of us has got to go. And it's not me. <laughs> And uh, so I was out of the house. <clears throat> years went on. Still had problems with my dad. There was two years there where we didn't speak. And, uh, and uh, then I became a Christian. And things in my head began to change. And, uh, and then my life began to change. And my pursuits began to change. Instead of Strictly focusing on what pleases me, what makes me happy, I decided to do what made God happy, what pleased God. And so I started heading in that direction. And things with me and my dad started to change a little bit. And we, we got a little closer. And then 
Um, our third child was on the way, pretty little girl back there, and we had uh, um, we had two children, and me and my wife, and we were living in a one-bedroom house, and I was trying to serve the Lord, and uh, and one day my mom calls me out and says, "Me and Dad want to talk to you," and I'm going through, I'm going to look at houses and. I'm thinking well, I'm going to get a different job so I can have a home for this little girl to come home to. Come out. And uh, they said, um, we're, we're buying a house in town and we want you guys to come and live in this house. And this house had uh, three bedrooms. Plenty of room for, for us and our kids. And so it was like my inheritance early. I wasn't like the prodigal son going, hey, dad, I wish you were dead. Give me all my money. They saw things in my life had changed. And they said, you come and live in this house. And I was so thankful. And I saw how God was changing my life and changing theirs and changing my family. And, and they, my parents got the house and, and pretty much by myself moved almost everything into their new house because I was so thankful and uh, we got to the last day my sisters came and their husbands and they got we got all the big stuff and, and we got to the door and my mom standing at the door and I looked at her and I said one of us has got to leave <laughs> and it's not me and she just had the biggest laugh and uh, and so I got that inheritance there was something for me even though I had screwed up and I had done everything wrong, there was still something in this earth left for me. You know what? My father in heaven is way better than my father and mother on earth. And, and that's what we have to remember. He didn't just change us. And that's what, what Nick was saying. We're looking for revival in this world, in this country. Our country is all stuck on, well, I got saved. So I'm going to heaven. Forget about all the rest of you. Forget about anything. I'm going to make myself happy until that time comes. And I'm just going to sit in this salvation and that's it. I hate to tell you, I really don't think that's salvation. That's like planting seeds and never having those tomatoes come up. Oops, there's, the water there, right. there's no fruit. What the use is that seed if nothing grew? But when God changes us, he changes us, and he has a purpose for that change. He wants to prepare us for the things that he's giving us. He's got an inheritance for us. And he wants to make us fit for that inheritance. So, I'm going to tell you a little story about the second worst name in the Bible. The first worst name is Methuselah. He lived 900 and Anybody remember 900 and, 900 and something years. Long time. Well, this guy didn't live that long. But he has the second worst name. Mephibosheth. So, that's a lovely name, isn't it? Mephibosheth, he was the grandson of Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel. So, he's king. So, next in line should be Jonathan. Mephibosheth's dad. So there was war going on. Jonathan and Saul died. Mephibosheth still still a little kid at home. And so new king's going to come. Family better leave the, the, the castle or whatever they had and go somewhere else. So the nanny picks up little Mephibosheth and starts running down the stairs. And she falls. And Mephibosheth's legs are all messed up. Mephibosheth never walks again. And so he's away from the capital city. And he's just there living. And uh, in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 9. Um, David is king and he goes I was good friends with Jonathan 
is there anybody left in Jonathan's family that I can bless? That I can bless? That I can give something to? And so they tell him, well, uh, Jonathan's son Mephibosheth is still around. And he says, okay, well, well, let's, let's get a hold of him. And uh, so this is the time where I should have underlined. Uh, Mephibosheth gets there. They bring Mephibosheth. And he says, what do you want with a dead dog like me? That was his identity. I'm a dead dog. People didn't like, they weren't, dogs weren't loved then like they are now. Dogs were out in the streets catching rats, getting into your garbage, tearing things up. They weren't love. They were just nuisances. And he says, what do you want with a dead dog like me? And David says, give this man back everything that Saul owned and that Jonathan owned. Give him back his inheritance. This is what he deserves. And so the rest of his life, Mephibosheth was to sit at the king's table, eat the king's food, and other people would go out and work the farm for Mephibosheth because he still couldn't walk. And he received his inheritance. And that's how God deals with us. You may have a horrible view of yourself. You have a different identity. But he says, You're, that's not what you are. I'm giving everything back to you that you deserve. I'm giving it back to you. I'm giving you your inheritance. I'm giving you an identity. And, uh, <clears throat> and even if you think, I'm nothing but a dead dog. And a lot of times, that's what people think of ourselves. And then we all hide in the midst of things. So we won't feel those feelings anymore. Don't hide anymore. Unless it's in, in the wings of your Savior. That's what it talks about in Psalm 91. God doesn't have wings, but He gives you that vision of Him holding you where you're completely protected in the shadow of His wings. And so that's what, that's what He has offered to you. So I want to tell a story. There's this place called Love Packages. Raise your hands if you know what Love Packages is. Okay, for the rest of you, um, it's in Butler, just over that way, 20 minutes. And uh, they take used Christian literature, and they send it all over the world. We're not talking about a room like this full of literature. We're not talking about a closet full of literature. We're talking about a warehouse full of literature. That stuff keeps coming in and in and in. And what was it? Uh, was it 50? Trailer loads last year. Huge, huge amount. Tons and tons and tons of stuff. Anyway, so all this stuff comes in. And they look through every single Bible. And uh, so when they get the stuff, they'll get the Bible and they'll do this little number. And there's a reason they do that. There was a family. And the father was Christian. And the children were not. And so the father, setting up his the inheritance for the kids, gone to the lawyer, set all this up, and he said to the lawyer, when I die, I've got this, this box of books. I've got, this, I've got these books on a shelf. When I die, I want you to box them up and bring them into the room where you're talking with the kids. And they'll know exactly what they are. And tell them they can have those books along with whatever else. Uh, but they have, to, they have to take them if, if they want. And so the man passed away. The lawyer got the kids together, sat the books there. And they're like, we don't want that. That's all his Christian books. We don't, his Bible's in there, all that study stuff. We don't want that. He said, now you're sure you don't want this because we're, we're going to send this to a place called Love Packages 
and they will be theirs. We don't mind. Just take that junk, get rid of it. So that box was in glove packages. This is before I had helped out there. Uh, but uh, they brought it in, and the lawyer said, "Go through these books, really good." Wink, wink. And so Steve's like, oh, "What's this about?" So he's open up the books. Clink, 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 clink. Picks up this coin. It's gold bullion. Everybody know what gold bullion is? It's one ounce of 99.999% real gold. As of yesterday, I checked it just to see what kind of money we're talking about. Yesterday, one coin was worth over $1,600. So there was a whole library of books. And they'd go through that coin. The coin would fall out. There was 15 coins, almost $25,000 coins. Catch that. That father had an inheritance for his children, and all they had to do was open up the Bible. But they refused. They wanted nothing to do with it. The Bible says that the wisdom it contains is worth more than silver and gold. That's one of our inheritances. And we can be like that family. And we can go, nah, I don't want that. And we can lose out on what's been given to us. And those, those children lost an inheritance. They lost something that they could not, maybe they could gain on their own. But it would have been just given to them. And they didn't accept it because they didn't like what it was hooked to. But I hope we're a little wiser than they are. And we can look past uh, little ideas that are in our heads saying, well, this is stupid. And I don't know about that. And then, well, look, get past your, your walls that have been thrown up by this world. Because this world says everything about God and Christians... It's all fairy tales. You're talking to an invisible friend. I'm bigger than that. But a lot of those people, they get to the end of their life and they start questioning. And they start questioning. And I can tell you right now, if they ask the second before they die, they can have that inheritance. But they've wasted a life. They have wasted the life that God has given them. God has created each one of us here. He's got something for us to do. That's the next one that we'll get to later. But the influence that we can have, the things that we can do in this world, the things that we can, when we get to heaven, God will come to you. Think about this. God can come to you. Well done, good and faithful servant. The king of the universe, the one who made the sun and the moon and the stars, can look you in the face and say, I'm proud of you. How much of today the men in this room and the men in this country wish some that their father would have come to them and said, I'm proud of you, son. There was no prouder day than me and my relationship with my dad. I had gone to pick him up at the hospital. We drove home, and we're sitting at Parkin in, in, in Hillsborough, or as we always called it, Parkin Pew. And, <laughs> and so we're sitting there waiting, and this lady walks up, and she starts talking to my dad. And he goes, oh, oh I, want you, I, want you to, I want you to talk to my son. He's a pastor. My father had never acknowledged never acknowledged that I was a pastor. He had never acknowledged that I had changed my life, other than my mom talking to me into giving us the house. And he never acknowledged that. But he told this woman, my son's a pastor, and he said it with pride. And he talked to her, and I said hi, and all this. And two months later, I asked him, do you remember talking to that lady? What lady? 
<laughs> he was still on medication. He didn't remember the conversation. And that was that moment that I had looked for all my life. Where he had finally said he was proud of me. And it was gone. But later, before he died, he asked me. He said, can you do me a favor? I got a job for you. I said, sure, if I can do it. You know, I don't, I'm not able to do much. Um, he said, I want you to come down and preach at Tremont Ridge, which is where he was living. And I was like, that's, that's the same thing. But God is saying, when, when, when you accept him and you live that life and you, and you live and use that inheritance that he gives you to make an impact, to make an influence on this world, and he comes to you at the end of time and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And I keep saying that the men, but men, that's what men need. That's what men crave. The Bible says it. Women need to be shown love. Men need to be shown respect. Men need to be shown respect. And to have the maker of the universe give you respect. That's worth a lifetime of work. That's worth a lifetime of giving of yourself to others and for others. That's what Jesus did. We're just walking in his footsteps. He gave his life. He laid it down for everyone else. And that's what he's calling us to do. In, in your uh, bulletin, I, I've got uh, 1 Peter 1, 4, I believe. Somebody want to read that out loud for me? Real loud. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And His great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and the life of the There you go. An inheritance that is will never say that again. <laughs> Can never perish. Can never perish. Spoiled. Will not be destroyed, spoiled. You have an inheritance that it's not going to get messed up. It's waiting for you in heaven. You can never perish, spoiled, or fade. It's kept in heaven for you. And so, <coughs> I, I want you to take a little trip with me. I, I, I would like us all to hop in a bus and go out to the junkyard. We all ready to go? Okay. Just imagine you go to a junkyard, you go to the trash heap, and you look at all the things that you had to have, the, all the things that you spent all your money on, because they all end up there, eventually. Eventually, everything that you spent your sweat on to get is going to end up in the junkyard or in the trash heap somewhere. Those are inheritances that fade away. The house that I live in hopefully will last my life and may last one of my children's lives, but eventually it's going to fall apart. The inheritance that we receive will never be corrupted, will never fade away. That's an inheritance that lasts forever. Because what you may not understand and, and the first, the first sermon I ever really listened to, when I was sitting on the couch at 27, and that day I got saved, the day I got changed, the preacher's talking about, uh, we're all going to live forever somewhere. And I'm like, that's not right. People are going to heaven, but people are going to go to hell, and they're dead. It's not what the Bible says. When it talks about Hell, it says, torment that goes on forever. In, in, uh, in Matthew 25, it talks about two groups of people. It says, there's some sheep on one side, some goats on the other. And the sheep are God's people, and the goats are not. And uh, so he said he separates them. Some over here, some over there, some over here, some over there. And so he says to the ones, the sheep, he says, when I was hungry, you fed me. 
When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was sick, you visited me. And they say to him, well, when did we do that? He said, whatever you do for the least of these, you've done for me. And they go, okay. And it says they go into eternal life. And then the other group, the goats, he says, I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me any water. I, I was naked, and you didn't give me any clothes. And I was in prison, you didn't visit me. I was sick and in the hospital, you didn't visit me. Here's your inheritance. Eternal separation, damnation, it's what you get. Those, <clears throat> and it says eternal, they're forever. So one way or the other, you're living forever. We, we get in this mindset of, I'm going to live this long and, that, and then it's over. And if I was right about... Christianity, well, then I'll go to heaven. If I was wrong, well, it's just a big dirt now. It says that it goes on forever and ever and ever. We, we, we have an inheritance, and the inheritance is heaven. I told you if we went to the junkyard, we went to the, to, uh, uh, the trash heap, there was thing, all these things that you spent your life trying to get there they are. Can anybody here tell me what is something? There's, there's some things. What lasts forever? Hint, hint. I just told you something. Tell me one thing that lasts forever. Your life. You will live forever. And not just you. Everyone in this room is going to last forever. Something's been pressing on me for a while now because I know how this works. This may be the last time I see some people here. It may be the last time you ever see me. I don't know. I could catch a disease, be in the hospital, be dead by next week. So could you. Come to grips with you're going to spend eternity somewhere. You better be right. <laughs> about what you think in your head. Because a lot of us don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. We go, ah, whatever. Think about it. So what else lasts forever? So what I'm saying is we're going to last forever. What else lasts forever? Any other thoughts? Yes, sir. What? A turtle lasts forever? Nope, I've had turtles. They die. I've even eaten turtles. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> He's going back. <laughs> Turtle soup. Pretty good. So, uh, what else? Uh, I got one. He's holding up his Bible. It says, The Word of God lasts forever. We got something else that lasts forever? God will last forever. And to my knowledge, there's really only one other heaven. So if God lasts forever, and he's in heaven, and we last forever, and we get a chance for heaven, and people will last forever, there's only so many things. Because really you could... If you come up with one, think, think over the week. Think of something that's going to last forever. Because more than likely, I, I mean, you might find something. I mean, I, I was debating this week when I was looking at it. Okay, in heaven, um, there's gold. It says the streets are paved with gold. So I'm guessing gold lasts forever. Our treasure. Our treasure in heaven. I would think happiness once you're in heaven. <laughs> so, but all those things. Once you're in heaven, 
are translated into heaven. So that's our inheritance. We either accept that or deny that. And uh, I mean, you're all here, so you must at least be <laughs> thinking, thinking, well, maybe there is. Uh, keep searching. The Bible says that those who search for me with their whole heart, I will be found by them. So if you search for him with your whole heart, you will be found by him. If I told you right now, I saw one of these up here earlier. If I told you there was a million dollars in here, there was one in here a minute ago. If, uh, if I told you there was a million dollars, if I told you somewhere in this church building there was a million dollars, you know what you'd do? You'd call off work next week. You would be looking through every crack and crevice, and you'd probably be breaking up all the stuff. You'd be thinking it was, maybe it's, maybe it's in the wallpaper. We'll rip down all the wallpaper, looking for a million bucks. And eternity, heaven, your soul is worth way more than that. And so, if you would take the time to search for this, take the time and make a diligent search to whether God is real whether Jesus lived and Jesus died, whether Jesus really died for your sin and for mine, and whether he really does offer eternity. And an easy place to search is right here. So uh, make a diligent search. Know for sure what you're accepting or rejecting. And then, next week, we'll talk about our influence. What are we going to do with what's been given to us? Because a lot has been given to you as, as a Christian. And what are we going to do with it? Are we just going to lay back and, and wait for heaven? Or are we going to do whatever we can to affect those around us? And help them to know and to understand exactly what open arms is kind of motto or whatever, connecting people to God, to each other, and equipping them to reach their world. Each of you have a world. You have a world of influence. And you can influence your children. You can influence your family. You can influence your friends, the people you work with. That's your world. And so that's what we're going to be talking about next week, where you're influencing. So... Do I have any questions before I we go on and go downstairs and eat and, and all that? Questions about what I was saying going, okay, where's that found at, Randy? And if you don't ask now, ask me later. Because I got lots of uh, addresses written down, but I wasn't going to just sit here and read everything to you. But you have a question, Jonah? Um, yes? What? Is that one of those toys? You got one of those toys at your house? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not done yet. Doesn't, doesn't everybody here wish they could do that with preachers? Mm. Come on, let's, let's go. Come on, let's get out. <laughs> Come on, it's time. There's food. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to pray here, Jonah. So, um, before I pray, I'm going to need some help. Um, there's some tables back there, and we're going to need some tables set up for people who can't make it downstairs to eat. So if you would be gracious and help with that, and we'll take all those green chairs that these guys are sitting on and put them around those tables. And then if there's people who can't make it downstairs, if you are so led, get them some food, bring it up to them, bring them a drink, and downstairs we'll need a couple of people to serve food probably. We get all the drinks all taken care of. At the end of the day, if you're still around or you want to come back, come back and help us load up the trash and sweep the floor and all that kind of stuff. That's all places where 
you, God needs each of us to do something. So, if you would help where you can. That, that's right. <laughs> Randy can only do so much and then he goes crazy. And people know how that works. Amen. They've seen it. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the food we're about to receive. We thank you for Pat that's coming and, and taking his time and, and Art that's with him and Michelle and, and her mom. Lord, thank you for, for people having a heart to serve others. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for, uh, for uh, Julie and Larissa doing the clothing. Lord, we thank you for all the people who have been giving clothing so we can do what you asked us to do, what you, what you asked the sheep and what you asked the goats to do, to clothe those who don't have anything. Lord, we're feeding those who need something. We have drinks for those who need something. And Lord, there's only, there's only so many that will be here today. But Lord, there's, there's other people in this room who are unashamed and will go out and tell people that they meet, you know what, every Sunday... You could come down there and get a free meal. And you come another Monday and you can get free food to take home. Lord, that's each of us doing that, our part. So Lord, show us where our part is. What, where we can serve you. Whatever we do to the least of these, we do to you. So Lord, when we're doing these things, we're doing them to you. We're, we're reaching out to you. And so Lord... Just thank you for this opportunity to do this. And Lord, help us to continue to do that. Lord, I thank you for, for Steve that goes into the prisons when they're allowing and, and, and visits the men in prison. And Lord, I'm sure there's someone here called to go and visit people in the hospital and people who are in the nursing home. Because they need you just as much as the ones running around out here do. And so, Lord, call us to the places that you want us. We're all parts of your body and we have different jobs. And so, Lord, we just thank you for, for accepting us. Lord, for adopting us and for giving us. For blessing us. And dear Heavenly Father, thank you for... The dry bones rattle. Lord, this church is a picture of that. Lord, a year ago we were five people hiding in my living room. And you opened things back up and you gave us, you gave us a building. So we paid for it. You gave us the money for the building. And Lord, you're, you're bringing us back to life. You're drawing people here. Lord, we just pray that you continue to do that. We just thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.